Welcome to the Kerry Newhoff Leadership Podcast, and I hope this episode helps you thrive in life and leadership. And if you enjoy it, hit the like button and subscribe to my channel so you never miss a thing. Look, pastors, I know how challenging it can be to keep your sermons fresh and relevant, especially when you preach week after week. So to help, I've created for you a 10-step preaching cheat sheet. After decades of preaching, I've simplified a sermon preparation method I use into a series of steps that help me ensure my sermons are engaging, relevant, and memorable before I deliver them. It's super easy to use, just 10 prompts, and you can start using it as quickly as today. Visit preachingcheatsheet.com or click the link in the description to get a free copy sent to you today. This episode is also presented by Generis. Now, Generis knows that while many churches take a one-size-fits-all approach to giving, there are several stages of giving that most givers go through, and it's essential for you to recognize each giver's unique phase. For example, the approach to a mature giver differs widely from that of somebody who's new to giving to the church. And so what you need to do is you gotta tailor the engagement to the distinct stages of givers, enabling the church to embark on a journey with each individual. The generosity strategist team at Generis understands the needs of each of these givers well, and they've developed free tools and resources to help you identify them in your church. To take advantage of these free tools or to schedule an introductory coaching call, visit generis.com slash carry. That's G-E-N-E-R-I-S dot com slash carry. And now to today's episode. So here's a challenge you're probably facing. You probably struggle with like, how do I know what shows to watch, what podcast to follow. Hey, we've got a very special episode of the Kerry Newhoff Leadership Podcast today, and we drill down on the best of the Art of Leadership Network. So my podcast is part of the Art of Leadership Network. We started it because we wanted to bring you some of the best content in leadership. So today, what you're going to see is a composite of a bunch of different shows that I endorse and enjoy sit back, relax, and maybe subscribe to a few extra channels. Here we go. Let's dive into today's episode. The Art of Leadership Network. Hey, podcasters. I'm Sean Morgan. I'm the host of the Leaders in Living Rooms podcast. I'm also the founder of The Ascent Leader, an organization that's geared around leadership development for local church leaders with a fundamental premise that local church leaders have access to unlimited content out in the world, but what they don't have is connection, not only just personal connection, but connection with high-capacity leaders that's built on trust and transparency and relationship which yields the most important leadership conversations. We call them living room conversations. That's the title of the podcast. If you're interested in what we believe is the most essential part of leadership development, leadership growth, we hope you'll check out The Ascent Leader and check out a cohort with us. The Leaders in Living Rooms podcast is really a slice of that, is taking these living room conversations and turning them into focused leadership learning for local church leaders. And what we decided to do was in 2023, we interviewed N.T. Wright. We had an exceptional conversation that we aired in October. And at the end of that conversation, which I hope you will listen to, we did something which is a little bit from his past, which is a former podcast that he was a part of called Ask N.T. Wright Anything. It was a great podcast that they stopped airing a little bit ago. And so what I did was I hit up a few friends from across the U.S. in different ministries and different local churches and said, if you could ask Tom Wright anything, what would you ask? And we came up with some brilliant questions, questions like, what are you most encouraged by when you look at the church in North America today? What sort of lessons do North American local church leaders need to be learning from New Testament leaders Uh, I love this one. If Paul were planting churches today, where would he be planting churches? And lastly, if Paul were to write a letter to churches today, what would be the content of that letter? And um, have so much respect for Tom Wright. His questions are so deep, so profound. He's kind and humble. I think you're going to love this 10-minute clip with Tom Wright. So let's dive in. The first one, I love this one, is what are you encouraged by when you see the church today? I'm encouraged when I see 
um, places where the church is actually being uh, the model of what a genuine multicultural family ought to be. Um, I had a friend who just visited today who is vicar of a parish in central London, which has every possible color skin in, in that you can imagine. And they celebrate the fact that uh, in Revelation it says, uh, a great multitude of every nation and kingdom and tribe and tongue, and there they all are. Um, and in my own work, I've come back again and again to Romans 15, um, welcome one another that with one heart and voice you can glorify God. And Ephesians 3, where it's through the church, the many colored wisdom of God, the Greek word there is polypoikilos, which is what you'd say when a flower garden had every color you can imagine. And when the people, because the people of God are supposed to be the new humanity. And if you go into a church and everyone looks exactly the same, or everyone has exactly the same accent or whatever, then that may be fine for a while, but actually, we're supposed to be a community in which people are drawn from many different backgrounds, every possible background. When you see that, and I think more Christians are aware of that, and th the thing is this, people are frightened of multiculturalism because if you don't have Jesus and the gospel at its heart, it may well not work. It may go horribly wrong. Our politicians are wrestling with that at the moment. Some of them are trying to do multiculturalism, but without faith, without Jesus. Ultimately, it can't be done. It's a noble effort, but the church ought to be modeling that. So I see that happening in various places. And I think, yes, this is the reality. This is showing the world that there is a different way to be human. Yeah, and it, it forces intentionality around the concept of unity, I think, when you oh, yeah. have so many different backgrounds, Absolutely. which brings a whole nother level of beauty to it. So I, I love that. Another question, um, what are the most prominent lessons today's church leaders could learn from early church leaders? Well, the very early church, through till the start of the third century at least, was pretty clear that the whole point of Christianity was not that our souls should get to heaven when we die, but that God would come and live among his human creatures on this earth. You get that with the renewal of the earth um, teaching in Arrhenius, in Tertullian, in Cyprian. Sadly, by the middle and the end of the third century, a great shift had taken place. But where you get that early church teaching, of course that means that this community, this ecclesial community, is supposed to be a model of what God wants the whole creation to be. And that is scary. People don't like it. Um, the Romans didn't like it. They tried to stamp it out. And where you see Christians living like that, then people may try to stamp it out again. Um, but those are the lessons that I wish people would learn because so often people jump ahead to the 4th or 5th century and say, well, we've got the Nicene Creed and we've got the Chalcedonian definition about who Jesus really is, and, and that's enough. And the Bible's kind of providing the footnotes. And I say, hang on, hang on. Already by the 4th and 5th century, some of that early witness has been lost because the early witness is to the kingdom of God coming on earth as in heaven, not in heaven as in heaven. That, I think, is the biggest thing to get right. So a follow-up question to that would be a question, are we supposed to be building the kingdom or waiting for the kingdom? We are supposed to be building for the kingdom. Paul says in Colossians chapter 4, which by a happy coincidence I was reading in my reading this morning, Paul says in Colossians chapter 4, he names certain people and says, they are the only Jews here who are among my fellow workers for the kingdom. So Paul doesn't think that we are building the kingdom. Jesus builds God's kingdom. But Paul does say that uh, be steadfast, immovable, because as you abound in the work of the Lord, what you do in the Lord is not in vain. We don't see how that works, but I go back to an image I used in Surprise by Hope, that we are like the stonemasons working on a medieval cathedral. The stonemason is just told, you've got to carve this bit of stone here, and you've got to make that pattern on it, and that's it. Stonemason pretty certainly doesn't know how that joins up with all the other stones that are going to be up there on the west front of the cathedral, whatever it is. But when the West Front is finally created, the stonemason will realize that he was working for, he wasn't building the cathedral, he was building for the cathedral. So what we do here in terms of creating those communities which reflect God's love into the world, which are outward looking, bringing healing and hope and medicine and teaching and so on to the world, and what we are doing there, even if that project 
uh, after five years has to close for whatever reason, or even if it seems a bit ambiguous in some ways, we are nevertheless sowing seeds. That's the other great biblical image. Again, another friend I met today um, was talking about that we were reminiscing about something that he'd been working on about 30 years ago, and he and I had been in touch, and he said something to me, and I put it in a footnote in my book and credited him with it, and then blow me, another scholar um, saw my footnote, followed it up, wrote a whole book about that thing. You know, you sow what looks like a tiny little seed, and in the mercy of God, it can grow into a great plant. And that's so often how kingdom work advances. That's good. That's a great story. Based on your understanding of Paul, if he were alive today, where do you think he would be starting churches and why? Oh, 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 oh. I mean, of course, it's a, it's a, it's a trick question in that Paul planted churches where there were no churches. Now, there's almost nowhere in the world where there are no churches. Um, and so one of the things that actually worries me is when there are several thriving churches in a town or city and somebody comes in and says, I'm a church planter, I'm going to plant a church here. Now, from one point of view, of course, because there are bound to be dozens, hundreds, thousands of people in this town who are not people of faith and somebody needs to reach out to those people and create a space where they can come to that. I, I have tended, because of my background and inclinations, no doubt, to go the other way and say, actually, here in the middle of this town is a big old Church of England with somebody who's struggling a bit, but let's put our shoulder to the wheel and get behind and help and create a youth group or a new um, movement of this or that. But let's do it together rather than um, splitting off in different directions. Because I think, um, I think people, okay, I'll say it like this. When I published my big book on Paul in 2013, Paul and the Faithfulness of God, I took it around all over the place. And people said to me, so if Paul came back today, what would he say to the modern church? And I said, the first and most important thing is he would worry about unity. Because when he's writing to Rome, where there are several different house churches with different ethnic compositions, or so it seems, he says, you need to figure out how to do this together with one heart and voice. And whatever's getting in the way of that, treat that as secondary in order that you can concentrate on the unity. We have uh, such a long way to catch up on that. But in terms of where Paul himself planted churches, I think his agenda was to plant the flag which says Jesus is Lord in places where Caesar was Lord. I think that's why Paul wanted to go to Spain. Spain was a major outpost of, Rome, of the Roman Empire. Some of the emperors came from uh, Spain. And I think if you look at where Paul went, there were many of them Roman colonies, Corinth, Philippi, uh, Pisidian Antioch. He is going to the places which say Caesar is Lord in order there to say Jesus is Lord. Now, who is Caesar today? What does it mean to announce Jesus as Lord in places where there are human rivals to Jesus? That's the question wow. we should be asking. Yeah, that's the question. Love it. Well, and in, in you actually answered what was going to be my next question is what would Paul's letter in the West, if he wrote a letter to the church in the West, what would it entail? It sounds like I, I think the unity and new creation, uh, that, that yeah. a new creation is not forget the old, let's do something totally new. In, in Latin terms, it's a creatio ex vetere rather than a creatio ex nihilo. That is to say, it's a new creation made out of the old one. The model is the resurrection of Jesus. He does not leave his body behind in the tomb. It is transformed into a new sort of physicality, but it's still the same, witness the mark of the nails. Now, mm -hmm. when we think about what it means to be a people of new creation, we are the same people, but transformed. And that means that the lifestyle of the followers of Jesus must be the lifestyle of those who grasp the original vision of creation in Genesis 1 and 2 and say, now, at last, God is doing this for real. That's what Jesus says in Mark 10 when they ask him yeah. about divorce. He says, well, Moses gave you that permission because you were hard-hearted, but from the beginning, it was one man, one woman for life. And in other words, Jesus is saying, my whole kingdom of God project is we're now getting that creational project back on track. I think if Paul was writing to the churches of the West today, he would say, you've got to be getting that creation project back on track. And when you do that, the world will see 
who the creator God really is. All right, podcasters, hopefully you learned a ton. Hopefully you were encouraged by N.T. Wright in that clip. It was a privilege to both get to do that interview with him and ask him those questions, and it's an honor and privilege to share this clip with you listening to the Carrie Newhoff Leadership Podcast. I hope you'll take some time to listen to Leaders in Living Rooms, to like it, to subscribe. And if you do like it, we ask that you would hit a friend up and let them know what you like about it and recommend it to them. Thanks so much. The Art of Leadership Network. Hey friends, this is Adam Weber. I'm the pastor of a church called Embrace here in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. I started the church when I was 24 years old and now I'm 41. I'm an author. I'm also a host of the podcast called The Conversation with Adam Weber. Every Wednesday morning, I release an episode that is 28 minutes long. And my hope is if you're trying to figure out how to make a difference with your life or you're walking through an unpretty part of being human, I want you to know that you are not alone. If you're not subscribed to The Conversation, go ahead and do that right now. As an added bonus, I often do giveaways through the podcast that you will not want to miss. Today, though, you're going to hear a clip from my interview with well-known country music singer Granger Smith. Back in 2019, the unthinkable happened. His three-year-old son, River, tragically passed away in a drowning accident in their family swimming pool. In this clip, Granger shares so candidly about grief and the journey of learning how to live again after going through this terrible nightmare. Listen in. What has helped you heal? After, I mean, genuinely, after one of the most unimaginable situations, how do you even begin to get your legs underneath you? You know, like how... Not even your legs underneath you. How do you get even oxygen in your lungs after something like that that just shakes? Um, yeah. What it, share, share that. So on a practical level at the beginning, because this is, you know, the book, Like a River, I tried to walk through really those about two and a half, two years after the loss. I'm going to walk through that journey and get pretty practical about it. But at, at the beginning of it, you're right in thinking, Hey man, you just need oxygen in your lungs, you know? And so, so at a practical level, sometimes you can't take a lot of this. It's like a golf swing. You can't take all this information at once. Like I need to be doing this and you need to be doing this. Sometimes it's like, you know what? I can't make it through the end of the day. So I'm going to try to make it to the afternoon and I can't do that. So I'm going to make it through this hour. <laughs> sometimes you can't do that. So I'm just going to make it through this minute. And then you think that's too much. This minute is I, it's too heavy on me. So you think I'm going to go to this next breath. Okay. And sometimes you're down to heartbeat by heartbeat. Like, okay, I, I made it through that breath. I made it through that heartbeat. The art and I guess I could do the network. next one. And s sometimes when we get, when we get focused on it in that kind of way, then we go, Okay, now I've collected seven or eight breaths. I've co collected nine or 10 minutes. Now I've collected, look, it's, it's noon and I'm still here. I'm still breathing and I'm experiencing this terrible loss, but you know what? I'm still here. M maybe there's something else for me. Maybe there's a, a deeper purpose through all of this pain. That's the beginning of it. That's, the, that's, the, that's ground zero. Granger, what did you learn about, what did you learn about God through this and... And what did that really coming to know him look like? Well, over the over, over those first six, seven, eight months after Ground Zero, after we lost River, uh, and I was trying everything I could to uh, help things feel better, to be the rock of the family, to be the person that the family could rely on. And you know, if they're upset, I wanted to be the guy that's not upset, so they could lean on me, and I could pat them on the shoulder and say, "We're going to be okay." Uh, that was slowly crushing me. You know, that was, that was slowly eating me away because I wasn't the guy. It was a facade. And I, I really just wanted to climb into a hole and disappear forever. <laughs> I, wanted to, I wanted to go into a dark place in, in Mexico and no one ever heard of Granger Smith ever again. There's a lot of times that felt like, <laughs> that felt like the best scenario. And so I realized at some point that I was drawn to listening to sermons on YouTube and it started with Billy Graham. I, it sometimes, somehow the algorithm 
um, on my YouTube channel because I was listening to a lot of self-help. Um, sometimes it would cross over into Christianity. And and once again, I want to say that I considered myself a full-blown Christian. Yeah. But my algorithm picked up Billy Graham and I started listening to him over Just totally, and over. To- totally random. You started listening to him? To- totally random. Nobody recommended it. Uh, I just I, somehow through self-help, the Billy Graham classic archives, which was were being uploaded to YouTube, started coming up on my algorithm. And, and I was like, oh, cool. Sometimes it was black and white and he was young with dark hair. Sometimes it was color and he was old with white hair. <laughs> but but I started I started hearing the pattern in what he was saying and, and I was drawn to it. And I was drawn to listening to uh, this message. And yeah. I didn't really know exactly why I was drawn to it. But then but then that algorithm started kicking up other other pastors and, and other sermons. And and one day I was listening to a pastor talking about uh, talking through John 14 and he was reading through it and kind of commentating as he, as he was reading. And, and the disciple asked Jesus, Lord, why is it that you manifest yourself to us, but not to the rest of the world? And Jesus answered him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. <laughs> and all at once, and the pastor kind of commentated and he said, that's not unconditional love. That is profoundly conditional. And uh, suddenly it just hit me. I just thought, oh man, I am loved. I'm still here. I am loved. I am being poured into. I'm an adopted son. I am ransomed. I am redeemed. I am healed. I'm restored. I am loved. And what am I doing with that love? Nothing. Jesus says, all you got to do is keep my word. And I instantly I thought, I don't know his word. I don't know his word. I, I've been reading these these supplemental devotionals, but what is this word? Like, have I ever gotten the Bible and just gone straight into the word? So I went home and I told my wife, I said, hey, we're not going to do these devotionals right now. We're going to sideline them for a little bit. We're going to go to Matthew 1 and start right there in the New Testament and just start reading down. You and I together. And she was like, okay. You know, thank God that she was on the same path as me. <laughs> <laughs> so I just started reading down. I just, I, I didn't want to skip any of the word. If I was going to keep the word, I didn't want to miss any of the word. So I started going, I went all the way to revelation. And then I, I was like, well, Jesus said the prophets were talking about him. So I better go back to Genesis and re- read the old Testament too. So I read the old Testament and then, and then I was just hooked on this. I just, I felt life in this. I felt like I was learning who God is. And by learning who God is, that's when I learned that he is sovereign, that he is holy, that he is glory, that he is love, that that he is providential, that he has the whole, as the, as the children's song says, he's got the whole world in his hands. If he's got the whole world in his hands, then surely he's acquainted with my grief. He understands what I'm going through. And he saw all of this. He saw all of this happen, and he knows that it's for a greater good. If I can trust that God with the, with my grief that's so small in relation to the rest of the world, if I could trust my God with that, what do I have to worry about? <laughs> right? Now, that, that's a lot to unpack, and that takes a long time to learn that kind of trust. But at that point was the key word for my, my whole life after that was surrender. Yeah. Stop trying to swim against the stream. If we have a great God, a all powerful, all knowing, Alpha and the Omega, holy God, if, if we have Him at the helm of our ship, stop trying to paddle. Yeah. Surrender to that. And when I did that, there was the peace. Yeah. There was the rest. It was all there for me. Granger, that's incredible. Um, Specifically with your son, after that time, was there a moment that you kind of brought that to God and brought that situation? Was that later on? Like, and that's probably not been a one time thing, but yeah, is there a time when you let God into that? There, there was times throughout that, what I call the rebirth, that I, that I continually surrendered my grief. 
and most importantly, probably my guilt in the loss of River, the guilt that I felt. I just, I was able to say this because the world's going to say, no, 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 don't feel guilty. It's not your fault. That doesn't help you if you truly feel like it is your fault. (laughs) So through that, I was able to say, I was able to say this, God, I am a sinner. I am guilty. But you could take this from me. You could cover my shame and my guilt. You can forgive me. You alone, oh God, because of your great love for your children. Take this guilt from me. And so there's a difference in saying, I'm not guilty. It's not my fault. There's a difference in saying, I am guilty, but Lord, you're covering it. And I find rest and peace in that. I am just a sinner, but you have had mercy on me. There is such peace in that. The Art of Leadership Network. Hey, leaders. I'm Jenny Katrin, the host of the Lead Culture Podcast. And it is an absolute honor to be a part of the amazing lineup of shows in the Art of Leadership Network. Lead Culture is a weekly podcast where we take a deep dive on a leadership or a culture topic and explore powerful insights and practical strategies to equip you with the tools you need to lead with clarity and confidence and build a thriving team. So today I'm sharing a bit from an episode titled Rhythms That Reinforce Aspirational Culture. Now, what exactly do I mean by that? Well, in this episode, I'm talking about the rhythms and the systems that you need to create to build that culture that you long for. See, the problem with culture is that it's really an outcome. So to influence culture, we have to be purposeful about what we're putting into it. We have to ask ourselves what inputs will lead to the outcomes we hope for. See, the key to embedding our values into our culture in a way that leads to true behavior change is in creating rhythms that reinforce our aspirational culture at every stage of a team member's journey. So in this episode, I share how to establish those rhythms in every stage, from interviews and hiring to meetings and celebrations. This incredibly practical episode will help you engage in every stage of organizational life with culture in mind. The problem with culture is it's an outcome, right? Like it is an outcome. And oftentimes we don't realize we have a culture problem until we're experiencing an outcome we don't like. And you've all been there. You've been a part of a team or you've been a part of an organization where you're like, wow, this is not, like I am no longer thriving and enjoying what I'm doing. And and sometimes it sneaks up on us, right? Like your team might've been a fantastic team in one season where the culture felt strong and healthy, And for some reason, there was a drift. And you wake up one morning and you're realizing this was not what we were before. Like something has shifted, something has changed. And there were probably some extenuating circumstances that created that. Uh, For many of us, the pandemic in the past three years has caused us to focus on strategy and just survival in some senses that we took our eye off of some of the cultural inputs. And now it's catching up with us. Uh, You're seeing disengaged staff. You're seeing the uh, um, transition of staff moving on, or you're seeing just a the um, quiet quitting dynamic of people just kind of being partially engaged. Like we don't have the same energy and passion and commitment in some of your teams that you previously had. And so to really influence culture, we have to be purposeful about what we're putting into it. So the question that you have to ask yourself is what inputs will lead to the outcomes you hope for. And that's what I want to camp out on today a little bit, is just to get you thinking about those inputs. Because a lot of times when I'm working with leaders or, leaders or teams on this idea, it feels a little overwhelming because a lot of things can influence culture, right? Culture is, the, you know, the people that are a part of your team and who how they work together to achieve the mission. And so it kind of feels like everything does influence culture. And to a degree, that's true. But I do think that there are some very specific inputs we can focus on, or at least I can give you some categories and some ideas to get you thinking. 
And that's my goal for today, is to give you some ideas, some ways for you to think about the inputs that you can influence. That's the big thing, right? Because a lot of times we feel like we're reacting to the culture of our team, right? Like we're now all of a sudden we're in reaction mode because we're realizing some things aren't so healthy. There maybe is some toxicity and we're realizing, oh, there's some work we have to do. It feels a bit overwhelming. And so what I wanna give you today are some things, some practical things, some inputs that you can do that start shifting your culture in the direction you're aiming for. So you see the key to embedding our values into our culture in a way that leads to true behavior change, because that's the essence of culture. When we're talking about a shift that's needed in our culture, we're talking about behavior change, and that's hard work. And y'all have heard me talk about before that uh, part of how we look at culture is uh, by defining those values that really are the guardrails. So we talk often that It's not just to name the value, but it's to define the beliefs and behaviors that support that value, and then to create memorable language around that value to help your team really embody it. We call that our uh, values grid. And so the key to embedding those values into your culture in a way that leads to true behavior change is by creating rhythms that reinforce that aspirational culture, like that target, like what are you aiming for? Who are we at our best? That's a great question to ask to help you define the aspirational culture. And so we wanna embed rhythms that reinforce that aspirational culture at every stage of a team member's journey, like every key point in a team member's journey. And so what I want you to think about is I want you to think about the rhythms of organizational life. Like when you think about team members, What are some of the consistent rhythms that happen? There are things like interviewing, right? When you think about new team members, they were interviewed, they were hired, they were onboarded. And then we have other rhythms like performance plans and review discussions. We have meeting rhythms. We have celebrations, hopefully. And so these are the things that I want you to be thinking about of where can I influence the culture that I hope for inside of these just normal rhythms of organizational life. So that's what I wanna give you a few ideas and a few tips for today. Because what I often recognize is we overlook some of just those simple, consistent rhythms that already exist in our organization. I don't need you to build all new things to influence culture. I need you to take those anchors of culture, those values, beliefs, and behaviors, and I need you to Uh, import them into your existing rhythms. That's how you create those inputs that lead to the culture output you hope for. Is that making sense? So let's look at these. I want you to consider how are you influencing culture at every point in your team member's journey? So beginning with interviewing, I suspect like most organizations, you've got a few open positions right now. And it feels a little desperate. Like you are, you are eager to fill those roles because your team has been covering the gaps. And so part of the interview process, sometimes we get hasty in that and we'll make short-sighted decisions. I want you to slow down the interview process enough. Some of you are already slow at interviewing, so you got to find the balance here. But I want you to slow that down enough to build in questions that test for culture alignment. Does the candidate value what you value? So go go back to your values. Does the candidate value what you value? I was talking to a leader the other day and in their organization, they realized they made a hire of a person who had kind of a posture of saying no first, Um, you know, just because kind of a gatekeeper in, in nature, not necessarily a bad thing. However, their culture is very much an optimistic yes culture. And so what she noticed after this person came on the team was that it was a it was a distinct culture clash. And by just a few questions, purposeful questions in the interviewing process, she might have been able to identify that a l- before the person c- got on staff. It might not have been a deal breaker for them coming on staff, I'll say, although I would say you've got to really evaluate how uh, if somebody has the propensity to embrace your values or if it's just not a value they hold. But you want to build questions that test for culture alignment. Does the candidate value what you value? And then you want to hire with that in mind. And so you've probably heard of the three C's of hiring, right? Character, chemistry, and competency. I want you to add the fourth C of culture. Hire for character. Absolutely. Don't sacrifice on that. Hire for competency. You need people who can do the work. Hire for chemistry. Are they a good fit? Do you enjoy being with them? Do they fit the team? 
and higher for culture. And here's where we get in trouble. We often confuse uh, chemistry and culture. We assume that if we enjoy hanging out with a person, that they're going to be a good culture fit. And most of the time, that's not true. There are some fantastic people that I really enjoy hanging out with. Like, they're a good chemistry fit. Like, they're fun to be with. But they actually don't hold the same values that we hold as a team, right? They may not have had that uh, commitment to follow through or excellence or um, communication or whatever that might be for you. I've definitely had those individuals where it's like, they're a great chemistry fit. But at the end of the day, the culture fit wasn't quite right. So I want you to be conscious of that when you make the ultimate hiring decision. And then as they're onboarding, make sure that you're really taking into consideration, how do I help this employee uh, get onboarded to our culture? How do I make sure that they know what's important to us? As I'm training them, as we're bringing them in, how am I making sure that they understand our values and that we're giving them, we're catching them up to our culture so far? So if you've done culture work with us, you know, we're going to help you build that value script. We're going to define what's, what are those core values specific to your team? What are the beliefs around those values uh, that really define why this value matters so much to you? What are the behaviors? What does it look like when that's in action? And how do we talk about it? Those sticky statements, those phrases, and the stories that kind of um, surround those ideas. And you have to make space when you're onboarding new team members to catch them up to that information, right? To help really help them understand those stories, the history, the why behind our values and, and spend time and energy helping them learn what we value and why. Now you can do that a myriad of different ways. We, uh, in the past, I have done uh, something called Culture Shock, which was a new class for new staff members where I would just rotate through the values and I do like a once a month lunch and I'd rotate through the values and I'd talk about them and I'd give new team members a chance to ask questions about them. So you can find different ways to do this. It should certainly be in your handbook, like anything culture related that you've defined should absolutely live in your employee handbook but then also creating spaces for the teaching and the conversation where you're really teaching the essence of your culture. Those are really extraordinary inputs and super important to help new team members catch up to the culture. And then you wanna think about some other rhythms, your performance plans and your reviews. Are you reviewing and evaluating for culture alignment, right? Like, and you can just put, add a few questions to your employee reviews and give the employee a chance to respond to how they're doing living into those values and give their manager a place to respond about how they're living into those values. Simple addition to your process that can be really powerful. The Art of Leadership Network. Hey there, my name is Christopher Cook and I'm the host of Win Today, a podcast focused on mental health, emotional health, and spiritual growth. In the clip I'm about to share with you from episode 360, Dr. John Deloney joins me to talk about the cost of living a borrowed life, how to practice resilience and courage through every season of life, and why a curated life is actually a fake life. Now, before we get to the clip, you know as well as I do that we are in a worldwide mental health crisis. With mental and emotional health challenges like depression and anxiety on the rise at an unprecedented rate, the self-help and industry continues to respond with feel-good promises it just cannot deliver on, leaving many people stuck in regret and despair. Now, thankfully, there is another way to experience lasting change in your life, to discover hope beyond self-help. That's why I'm so thrilled to tell you about my new book, Healing What You Can't Erase, Transform Your Mental, Emotional, and Spiritual Health from the Inside Out. In it, you'll learn why transformation beats willpower, self-help, and self-healing, how to recognize and heal what pop psychology and self-help fail to treat, which is a broken spirit, and you'll learn well-researched, biblically grounded strategies to revitalize your mental and emotional well-being every day. Now, my publisher has graciously made a sneak peek of the book available to you immediately. You can go to healingwhatyoucantarace.com right now to sign up and receive a free sneak peek of the book before it hits stores in March. Start moving forward on your journey of transformation today. Download a free preview of my new book at healingwhatyoucantarace.com. Right now, let's get to my conversation with Dr. John Deloney. 
Yeah, let's stay on disempowerment. I want to know why and what what are the tentacles of disempowerment? What do they look like? And maybe it's related to this because you just said we've created a world our bodies can't exist in. What do you mean by all that? I mean, uh, our bodies were designed for seasons of cold and seasons of hot. And our bodies were designed of seasons of plenty and seasons of not plenty. And our bodies were designed mm. to carry heavy things. Mm. And our bodies were designed to move all day. And um, in an effort to make things predictable, which I love, and to make things, um, hey, we can count on tomorrow being similar to today. And hey, instead of starving for a season and a whole bunch of people passing away, what if we just ship in apples from Guatemala and we ship in avocados from wherever? And uh, we can solve for food. And instead of not having any water, we can just pump it miles and miles and miles away. So we've solved for all these issues. Yeah, and at the same yeah. time, our bodies weren't designed to have all these issues solved. And so we've we've created a world where if you miss one, if you're five minutes late to one meeting, your whole day falls over and your whole week falls over and your whole life falls yeah. over. We've created bank accounts yeah. that, man, if you say the wrong thing at work and you get fired, they take your house, they take your cars because you, none of us own anything. We borrow money to, to mm -hmm. lean up against stuff that we use and, mm -hmm. and on and on and on. So we've created a world that our bodies just can't exist in. And then we have a bunch of charlatans and I'll even go as far as to say a bunch of people who are really well-meaning really yeah. trying hard to, to help tell us, well, if you feel this way, it's because you aren't working right. And I can fix it through my supplements, through my, this, through my special program, through my whatever. And, um, yeah, it's just whatever. So when it comes to disempowerment, there's a lot of money to be made by making you feel like you're less than, and I can solve it for you. There's a lot of power to be gained by rounding people up and saying, hey, um, this happened to you. You're always going to be less than unless I come rescue you. Um, join me. And so, mm. and let's find an enemy. And our enemy is them. It's whoever them happens to be. You feel uncomfortable, it's because of them. And so we've just created a culture that's so opposed to discomfort in any shape, form, or fashion, even great discomfort, um, that... Uh, We've lived these unintentional lives. And when you live unintentional lives, man, people will hook their their money-making schemes to us. And then all of a sudden you find that you are not in the driver's seat of your own life. Yeah. So is it like, are we, or have we created unintentionally these borrowed lives because of the, not only financial debt, but relationship deficits in our lives and our emotional unhealth? Like, are we living, to extend the metaphor, like borrowed lives so much so that that those borrowed lives then um, create this world that is unable to sustain how we were designed. I love you said that. Can I tell you, it's a, it was a crazy moment for me. I took, I remember taking my wife, we went to, on a date to see um, La La Land. And I loved the movie. It was great. The ending was sad, which, but it was perfect. Oh, I loved it. The actors were great. Ryan Gosling um, and I, we look almost identical. Mostly on our upper bodies, we're almost exactly the same. <laughs> Let's go. Not at all. Let's go. <laughs> Not even close. Uh, and all the actors were, everyone I think was great. But I remember walking out of the movie. And, and for those of you who haven't seen it, there's a lot of scenes in jazz clubs where there's some really extravagant dancing and piano playing, yeah. people laughing, having fun. And I remember holding my hand, my, my wife's hand as we walked out of the theater through the parking lot. And I remember thinking, huh, I just paid $35 for two actors in Hollywood to spend an evening in jazz clubs and dance and enjoy themselves for my entertainment. And I thought, I could have just spent 35 bucks and taken my wife dancing. And so when you say that, yeah, I outsourced that evening. And what I also outsourced was movement. I didn't have to sweat. I outsourced all of the vulnerability because I'm a terrible dancer. Um, I outsourced the, I don't know where to park at the downtown jazz club. Like I outsourced all of that discomfort to how about I just pay these two people who are more beautiful than I could ever dream to be of being. What if I just give them money and they can have the date for me? And so, or when it comes to food, I'm not going to grow my own food. Why would I do that? You grow it and I'll just come buy it out of your box. I'm not going to hunt my own food. I'll buy it. You do that. You do all the dirty work and I'll just eat it. Um, in a nice round shape, right? We outsourced everything. And I think our frontal lobes know that's an excellent move. Very cool. This is this works out for us. 
I think it's our amygdalas and the memory parts of our brain that are screaming at us. Hey, we're not safe. We're not safe. We're not safe. We're not safe. And that's, 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 yeah, I think we've completely outsourced everything. Yeah. Let's stay here. I hadn't thought about that. Okay. If we're outsourcing everything, outsourcing relationships, vulnerability, um, risk, outsourcing, um, discomfort, as you said, I think about Michael Easter's book, the comfort crisis masterpiece. Uh, Oh my gosh. Yeah. And I know he endorsed your new book, which is so cool. Um, what happens when we outsource and what are we, what other things are we outsourcing that we don't know we are outsourcing thus unintentionally catalyzing the internal crisis that is just lighting flames upon our nervous well, systems. I mean, what happens, uh, COVID's a great idea. I mean, it's a great, ex- not a great idea, it's a great example. S- supply chain. We just quit Bingo. making stuff. Bingo. Oh, they're going to make it. Cool. And then we ran out of cars, man. Like, we ran out of wood. Like, because we outsourced it all. And so, there is something about partnering and working with your community. Everybody can't be an island of to themselves. But I think the economists who started speaking up saying, we've been saying this for years, man, if you get rid of all manufacturing, you get rid of all production, you get rid of all these things, there's going to come a day when they go, eh, we're not doing that. Um, and so I think it, I think it creates a sideways mess. And when your body knows, Hey, the power just went out and I don't know how to turn that back on. Hey, uh, the grocery store was out of milk today. I don't know what to do. Like, or when you need groceries, like I happened to me when I was a kid and the bank said, there is no more dollars. Right. Out. And my dad, yeah. I remember that look on his face. Um, man, your body knows your body knows. I think the big outsource that we don't talk about much. And this is, I don't, we don't talk about this in faith communities and we don't talk about this and I'm, I'm being generic faith communities, any of them. And we don't talk yeah, about right. this enough in the scientific community um, where I spent a long, a lot of time is I think we have outsourced God, the idea that we are have to be in submission to something bigger than ourselves. And when you do that, when you clip the tether, when you clip that line, when you don't have to walk outside of your tent or your hut and look up to the sky and say, God, whoever, God's God, whatever, please reign or my family dies. When you don't have to do that anymore, you just turn on a faucet. It's real easy Whoa. to think you're God. I pay my water bill and that's my water. Dude, somebody built that pipe and pumped it way far away. And so I think over time, really, and not over time, really quick, we have cut the strings to any sort of cultural narrative around, hey, all of us are in the same story. And everyone said, no, I get my own story. I get my own truth. I get my own narrative. And when you do that, you end up worshiping yourself. And then you start worshiping how you feel. And then when you don't feel good, you start asking other people to bend their lives to get, and so you see, and now we, boom, this is where our culture is. And so um, I don't know a path forward for a non-anxious life without, without knowing I have to submit to something bigger than myself. So how is outsourcing life, outsourcing God, how is it neutering uh, the perseverance, the muscles of perseverance and endurance and grit, the ability to just move through pain, not avoid it. And I'm just thinking off the top of my head here, how, how is this willingness to outsource all these things, atrophying our ability to cope with life? I, I love that you, you phrase the question that way, because I think that we have done a poor job with things like resilience and courage and bravery. I don't think those are things that you have or don't have. I think those are jump shots and free throws. I think those are skills that you practice. You practice resilience. When people say, how do I get more confident? Well, do some things that you can be successful in. And then your body goes, oh, we know that. Um, And so I think when you look at those things as skills, and then you look at um, our classrooms that are drill and kill, Mm -hmm. like, right, they're algebra questions and you do worksheets. And then my son was watching Khan Academy videos in his school. And I remember thinking, I said to him yesterday, Dude, I don't want to pay taxes to have you go to school and pay somebody to tell you to turn on a TV and do something that you can do right here in my living room for free. And then I'm paying a babysitter. I'm not paying a teacher, right? But we've created a world where we don't teach those skills anymore. And if you don't have to do those things on a regular basis, like you, you use perfect word, that those muscles atrophy. I don't have to be resilient. You have to stop saying things that hurt my feelings. 
I don't have to um, lift heavy things. I just push a button on my cell phone and food just shows up at my front door. And so I don't have to do, oh, you don't, I don't have to have a messy conversation in my church. I'm going to the other one because there's a million of them on every corner. And so I don't have to go through any of these challenges. The problem is your mom's still going to get sick. The problem is your husband's still going to leave you. And life will, the storms will come. And if you don't have the muscles, if, you're, if you've let everything atrophy, there's, there's, there's nothing to hold you when, when the storm comes. Friendship, friendship is a skill that we just let atrophy. The Art of Leadership Network. Well, what is up, Ascent family? So unfair advantage. I'm here with the Andy Wood, and we are talking church planting. Honestly, Andy is one of the best people alive helping church planters. I am biased, and I get to be able to do this together, and we love church planting. My name is Mike Hickerson. I'm the lead pastor of Mission Church in Ventura. Andy is, what do you do? I can't even remember what you do right now, so help us. Yeah, I try to keep up with uh, two teenage boys and a nine-year-old girl. That's kind of the main thing I do right now. Yeah, I'm, I've got a 21-year-old, an 18-year-old, and a 15-year-old, all girls, so game on. Now, Andy leads Saddleback in, in Orange County and about 20,000 campuses around the world. So Andy's a, a phenomenal leader. So go ahead and tell about that journey a little bit. Yeah, so um, if you're just tuning in, Stacy and I, we moved to Southern California in summer of 2022 from the Bay Area, and we had planted a church there called Echo Church. We'd been there for 14 years. It's been a fun journey. It's been uh, very overwhelming and really forced me to rely on God and the team around us. Uh, but we've seen God do some amazing things and seen a lot of breakthrough, but still have a lot of work ahead of us. Saddleback, such an incredible church, incredible staff, one of the most loving groups of people I've ever been around. So we're super grateful. Um, and at the same time, we are at the edge of our human capacity forced into dependence upon God and people. I love that. And so what the Edmund Advantage is, is people that have been planting, love planters, want to resource planters as best as we possibly can. Looking back, not because we're experts, but more we want to just be helpful to the next generation of planters coming behind us and the, behind them and behind them. But we just want to kind of pour out our cup of like, here's what we're learning. Here's what, we, what we've seen. Here's how we're helping planters now. So we've been thinking through the, the why you would plant, the where you'd plant. And so today we're going to talk about the who. And the who is a massive deal, not just about who you are as character, but who you are on your team with you. Yeah. So as we're thinking about the who, Andy, maybe give us a frame in your mind as like, how does a planter or someone who loves planters or someone who is an organizational uh, like leader of planters, how do they, how do we help each other think about who should be on the team? Cause we can't have a thousand staff as a church plant. That'd be great. Right. And we can't only have one staff. And if you're a one staff church planter, God, I just want to give you a hug. It's going to be okay. But like, how do we navigate who should be around us? How do we invite people in? What are we looking for characteristics? So just give us a frame for that. Yeah. Well, I would say, first of all, like if you start from a biblical angle, you know, look at the way that God works. Whenever God does a what, he first finds a who. And almost all of the time in the Bible, that who puts together a team of people and they build something with empower, empowered by the Holy Spirit. So there, there's like very few lone rangers you're going to find in the Bible that aren't working. Even the Apostle Paul that we all you know look to, you see so many examples of all these names of people that he built the kingdom with. So it's a core conviction for me that like even when you look at the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, God did things in community as a team. It's built into the character of God. It's built into Scripture. God even, you know, kind of, I, I say jokingly, like I'm forced into dependence upon other people, which is, you know, force is such a strong word because it's by design. God, God didn't make any one of us to have all the gifts that we need to fulfill the calling that he's placed on our lives. So if I'm thinking back to like planters that I know or that are in that process or even maybe listening and pr processing, like how am I supposed to plant? Should I plant? I don't know what network yet. I'm trying to figure out the where. And then 
Um, so if someone in a, that's a thinking they're supposed to plant and they're, and they're the right person and then they have the right place and right is mm-hmm. uh, in air quotes. Um, yeah. But there's no one around them or there's no other couples or there's no other individuals or there's no other staff. Like how would you in, like uh, encourage or what would you have them process if they're like, man, I don't know who yet. Like I don't have anyone from my past or I don't have anyone from a team or a current team. What, what would you tell them to do about like the who as they're starting this journey? Yeah, first, I think it's such a great question, Mike. And you, you and I have, have had conversations about this just as we've both had the opportunity to have lots of conversations with church planters. Like when you started, you had a few families that moved with you. Same, same for us. We had uh, three families that moved across the country. And then we had more people that would eventually move over a couple year period of time. Uh, those relationships, when you look back, some of them for me were as early as high school. Some of them were college friends. Some of them were people we had worked in ministry with at different times. So all along the journey, one of the core convictions is, you know, God, God is not in the business of wasting relationships. So every person that God brings into my life or your life, I believe God brings there either to fulfill, to use me to fulfill the purpose and the call that he's placed in their life and to use them to, to fulfill the purpose and call he's placed on my life. It's, you know, it's really a both and. And so when I have that perspective, I'm more open in my relationships. So a core conviction for me, even in the whole journey was I always, I always want to make sure I'm good with the people I'm, I'm working with now. And then afterwards, like when, when we go different ways, I want to do everything I can to make sure everything's said so there, you know, there have been all these relationships. I would say if a church planter is at a place where nobody wants to plant a church with them, that's a really good indicator. That's a, that's a mirror into our soul. And I would say it's probably a form of, of breaks to like say, okay, well, why is that? What is it? What is it? Is the vision not clear? Am I not wired? Maybe relationally, there's some deficits in how I've related to people over time that nobody nobody wants to take this risk with me. I also would say if you're you're younger, sometimes your network is not as developed because you're in your early 20s. But to be intentional as you're in, as you're building out, you know, to build relationships in such a way that you're doing life and team with people, and you're you're investing in people in such a way that as you go along, not all of those relationships will become people that would plant a church with you, but all of them might be people that at some point in the future you'd encourage in ministry. I've got some buddies. We just spent some time together in April. We were in high school together. We did small groups together in high school. They're now senior pastors. So God didn't call them to plant a church, but now we're still, we're still friends serving in the kingdom together alongside of each other. So I would just say never try to try your very best as, as the scripture says to be at peace with all people don't burn bridges and then try to have an open mindset of like relation god uses relationships from our past into the future to fulfill his calling both in our lives and in the lives of the people that we we relate to that, that's so good i would have challenge everyone to go back and listen to that again <laughs> so uh, because if no one's following you, you have to ask yourself why, and not everyone should follow you because it's not their calling. And I know that's something that we'll get into, but that at the very least, they should be for you and praying for you. So how do we kind of foster the kind of health below us as we're leading in our early years and around us, next to us relationally, that people are going to be for us as we get into our next uh, seasons of life? The Art of Leadership Network. Hey everyone, I'm Brad Lominick. I am the host of the H3 Leadership Podcast. H3 stands for Be Humble, Stay Hungry, Always Hustle. Each week, I try to curate the best for leaders to stay in the know. Curate the best for leaders to stay in the know. I provide links, recommendations, resources, podcasts, books you should read, etc. Voices you need to know. I also usually have guest interviews each episode. I am now close to 200 episodes into the H3 Leadership Podcast. And in this clip, I'm actually going to give you a lesson on the difference between connecting and networking. I believe that connectors 
are the greatest kinds of leaders compared to being a networker. And here's a eight minute clip on why that's true and the difference between being a connector and a networker. Connectors ultimately are others focused, networkers are me focused. So enjoy this clip. Love for you to tune in, subscribe to my H3 Leadership Podcast, and let's keep leading well, friends. Be humble, stay hungry, always hustle. Here you go. Let's jump in here with a leadership nugget for this episode. I want to talk about connecting versus networking, networking versus connecting. Now, don't get caught up on the words. I believe that uh, we're all, we all have a, a role, a stewardship in terms of being a connector. And, uh, you know, you might say the, the, uh, the networker is somebody that is uh, the opposite of a connector or the other side of a connector. And let me break it down for you because I, I, I've spent my life uh, being a connector or trying to be a connector. And I would say this, um, networkers are me-focused and connectors are others-focused. So when you think about the, uh, you know, the difference here, one kind of person is focused on themselves. Now, they might look the same, but connectors at their core are focused on others. Connectors have an abundance and generosity mindset that there's plenty to go around. Uh, others winning is the win. If somebody else wins, that means they win and I win. Networkers are small thinkers. They're small-minded thinkers. They protect, they hoard. They think that if others win, it's a threat. It's a, it's a lose situation. It's a win-lose environment. If you win, I lose. And if I lose, you win. Uh, small thinkers, networkers are small thinkers, but connectors have an abundance. They have a big thinking mindset. Uh, networkers are, are addition-minded, but connectors are multiplication-minded. And here's why, because they collaborate. They think collaboration. They think, they think the ability for me to get people to work together allows for us to multiply our efforts. Um, networkers are transactional, but connectors are relational. You might say it this way, connectors are transformational. Now, let me stop here because you might want to take notes. I'll put notes, I'll put these notes in the, in the show notes, h3leadership.com, you can get them there. And, uh, but, but if you're taking notes, you know, again, I'm, I'm trying to compare the two as we go throughout this, this leadership nugget, this learning, this, uh, this teaching here. So networkers are transactional, but connectors are relational. They're transformational at their core. Because they're relational, they end up being transformational. This idea of me versus you, you know, networkers focused on me, network uh, connectors focused on the other person, focused on you, you might say. Connectors are long-term. They think about the long-term play. They, they don't feel like they have to, you know, win in the short term. But networkers are short-term thinkers. They think the only opportunity I might have is this one meeting. So I've got to get everything out of it. I've got to make sure I do the pitch. I've got to make sure I tell them all about the product. But connectors, they think long-term. They, they think that this is uh, the long haul is what we're thinking about. I would say it this way, connectors are catalyst. You know, connectors have the ability to, to create a spark, to create something that ignites change, but it's not about them. They ignite change that's not about them. Connectors add value to others. Networkers subtract value from others. Networkers keep score, but connectors always win. So connectors are in the game, but they're always winning. But networkers keep score. You know, networkers are small-minded. So they think, well, I've helped you twice. So it's now time for you to help me because I've helped you twice. That's a networker mindset. But connectors don't keep score. They're, they're just always winning. They're always helping. They don't, they don't, keep, they don't look at the scoreboard. Uh, connectors are kingdom-minded, but networkers are temporal in their mindset. Connectors are generous. Networkers are selfish. Connectors have influence. They have impact. They have legacy. Connectors are memorable. Networkers I want to erase from my memory. Now, this is important. Connectors, when, I, when I'm around a connector, when I walk away from that conversation, that interaction, I remember them. But networkers, I walk away and I think, man, hopefully never again. Hopefully, I won't ever run into them somewhere soon. Connectors, I look forward to seeing. Networkers, I avoid. Uh, you know, you go to the gathering, and when you see that connector, you you want to 
to uh, to talk to them. But networkers, you're trying to avoid. You're trying to stay out of their line of sight. You're hoping they won't come over and talk to you. Connectors are power brokers. Networkers are power seekers. Networkers are they're starving for power. They want it so bad. But connectors, they allow for power to flow through them. They're they're truly a broker. They're a they're a transistor of power. They allow it to move on past them. Connectors are invited and included, but networkers are avoided. They're actually left out. They might get the one invitation, but that's it. Where connectors are always invited back. They're always included once they've been around. Networkers are controlling, but connectors are releasing. Releasing compared to controlling. Connectors release, but networkers try to control. And this releasing that connector, connectors do, it creates currency and appropriate kinds of power. Connectors have equity. They have credit in their account. They have credibility, credibility, credibility. But networkers, they're renters. They move on. They don't have a lot of equity. Once they've sort of like uh, sucked it out of you, they move on to somebody else where they can f- try to uh, rent for a few interactions, a few meetings, a few engagements, a few product launches, but then they move on to somebody else. Connectors control the room by inviting others in. Networkers work the room by trying to get in. Hello. Connectors control the room because they invite others in. They have currency and power because they're allowing other people to be part of the conversation. But network networkers are trying to work the room. They're trying to get into the room and then work the room. And everybody's then trying to avoid them that's in the room. I stay away from networkers in the green room. But the connectors, I move towards. I hope to get time with them. I'll line up and wait to talk to them. I move towards them. There's a gravity about connectors. And then uh, networkers are one-hit wonders. <laughs> connectors are long-term contributors and long-term participants. Okay, there you go. That is a long list, my friends. A laundry list, you might say, to break down this idea of connecting versus networking. And again, the links will be, or the notes, show notes will have all those uh, breakdowns, the different uh, comparisons between networkers and connectors. Ultimately, at the end of the day, the reason I bring this up is I want people to be connectors. I want people to have a abundance, generosity mindset. You know, when when you when you take the the posture of a connector, all of a sudden your currency, your credibility, and your influence and impact, an ultimate legacy goes up. Um, don't allow don't allow the short term. Don't allow the the pressure. Don't allow, don't allow the trying to get the sale to be the thing that now drives you. Um, if, if, you, if you add value to people, friends, again, John Maxwell taught me this, and it's still true. If you add value to people, you win. Connectors are value adders. They add value to others. And so hope this has been helpful. Hope, hopefully you can uh, take this, teach it within your teams, teach it to the leaders that you're connected to, and take one of these things and just think, how do I put this into practice? How do I actually make this practical in the way that I do life, I do leadership, I do friendships, I, I approach community engagement, all the things that you're doing on an everyday basis. There you go. Connectors versus networkers. Again, all these will be in the show notes, h3leadership.com. The Art of Leadership Network. Well, that was a delightful sampler and so many insights. And believe it or not, yeah, we got show notes for you. So you can go to kerryneuhoff.com slash episode 621 to see what we have there and also check out some of the guests, the podcast. It'll be an easy way to subscribe to another podcast as well if one of them really caught your ear or your eye. And uh, well, make sure you check it out because I'll tell you, these are shows that we vetted, that we believe in. And as you set up your podcast deck for 2024, hopefully you found one or two you can add to your rotation. Hey, today's episode is brought to you by My Highly Productive Leader Challenge. If you want to have a way better 2024 in terms of knowing what to say no to, how to manage your energy, getting everything done ahead of time, and having time left over for your family, go to Productive2024.com, but do so before January 5th, because that's when I'll close registration. And say goodbye to stressful days spent turning your sermons into content and a lot of annoying administrative tasks. Spend time on what truly matters in ministry. Visit church.tech to learn how you can use their AI tools to bolster your ministry. That's church.tech 
www.thebigbrand.tech. Man, I'm pumped for next year. I'll tell you, normally I do this post called uh, Church Trends, right? So I've got seven disruptive church trends for 2024, but we've never really brought it out here on the podcast. But that's what we're going to do. We're going to bring it out on the podcast. JP Pakluda and Gabriel McCullough are going to help me work through the church trends that I've identified. Then I'm going to talk about other trends with episodes from David Kinneman, Ryan Burge, Brady Shearer, John Mark Comer, and a whole lot more. Plus also next year, we've got John Ortberg, Todd Bolsinger, Lee Strobel, Jamie Kern Lima, Craig Rochelle, and a whole lot more for you. If you haven't subscribed yet, maybe a friend sent you this episode, I would love for you to do that. If you subscribe, it'll be a lot easier to listen. We'll get to do this together next year. And when you share this episode and you leave a rating and review, you text it to a friend, I am so grateful. Uh, I am so thankful for you. We get to do this because of you. And I know you pay with your time. We take that very seriously. And I got one more thing, one more free thing before you go. Every Friday to about 100,000 leaders, I send out my On The Rise newsletter. It's a curated newsletter where I have searched the internet. And you know, there's so much information out there. I send you the five or six best things I've found that week. Insights on faith, culture, the future of the church, and other really curious, quirky things. People seem to be loving On The Rise. I'd love for you to join that email list. You can go to ontherisenewsletter.com. That's ontherisenewsletter.com. And you can start receiving those as early as today. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. And I hope our time together today has helped you identify and break a growth barrier you're facing.